when the Maryland State Arts Council was seeking organizations in each county to represent them and to be part of the State Arts Council, uh, he was the right person for choosing uh, how that would happen. So the Kent County Arts Council was formed, and this was in the late 60s. And he would be very, uh, very determined to try to promote the arts. There would be somebody standing on the corner in downtown Chestertown, and he knew that they were a painter or an artist of some sort. He would collar them and say, I want you to do a show. I'll, I'll produce a show for you. Give me three pieces of art. And they were like, okay. <laughs> and that was early on. And the other thing that we did as a, uh, as a, a small, a small committee put together Actors Community Theater. Uh, that was in, by then it was the 80s. We'd already done a whole bunch of other Arts Council stuff. So Actors Community Theater lasted for several years. We did over 100 productions. That seems like a lot, and it seems like a lot as I look back on it. We were um, given, generously given the use of the small theater at Washington College to do our productions while the college was on break. Uh, we ended up uh, being um, establishing an art gallery uh, in the building that's now being renovated, which will become um, a bigger arts venue. And as you know, they're going to name after Vince and me. I'm very excited about that. So at that point, we had an art uh, gallery. At, and now um, I had been sort of handed over the directorship of the Arts Council, and we started to have once a month, on the first Friday of the month, we would have an art show. There would be a new uh, artist, uh, individual artist show. We would combine it with an individual coffee house. For a while we did it, uh, the Episcopal Church would allow us to use their parish hall sometimes for performance. Everyone has always been so generous and so giving when it comes time to sharing space, sharing energy, and even sharing funds when we need them uh, to produce these things. So for a long time, and I don't know how many years, it might have been seven or eight years, every first Friday I would produce a new artist, and we would have a, a show that lasted a month. Uh, then we started having our coffee houses in the coffee house. Play It Again Sam's had just opened, um, and we would transfer after our opening reception for the art show, we would transfer ourselves down to the, uh, the coffee house and have a performance there. So that, that went on for a few years. And then uh, as the arts started to blossom more and more, it seemed evident that I didn't have to be the only one put producing a show at my little building, that all of the art galleries were starting to develop and become uh, engaged in the community. And that's when First Friday started. It was Carla Massoni who really led the charge on that one. And art, um, artist, arts venue, um, shops would be open, there'd be musicians in the street, and First Fridays just took off. And when it happened, it was the, the first one I remember I went, oh, I feel like the kids have grown up and gone to college. I can just sit back and just go to stuff. And it was so much fun. And it, it too, has had its own life and it gets bigger and better all the time. Sumner Hall's story, I think, is interesting to me. Um, I became very, very involved with the African American community when I took a job as a um, a person who oversaw some arts activities uh, and other activities at the Kent County Senior Center. At the time, it was uh, it met in the space over the town office, nice, beautiful upstairs space. The most of the participants of the Senior Center, uh, I'd say about three quarters of them, were elderly African American women who were so fabulous. 
So I was there to think of activities and little art things to do, but lots of my time was spent sitting at the tables with them, hearing their stories. I actually did some oral histories and recorded them on my little Walkman. But basically, what happened is I became really good friends with a lot of people. Well, I became very attentive to their, their life stories. So basically, a lot of it revolved around music. And I was invited once in a while to an event in one of the little black churches or one of the little black communities to um, just be invited as a guest to come and see it or hear it. And became so enthralled and so proud of the talent and the intensity and the amazement of the local talent and really something that I knew a little bit about, but now I know a lot about, which is the history of black sacred music. Then I started thinking, well, if, this, if everyone can sing these songs, they can probably do a fine job with a James Brown song or Otis Redding song. And the very, one of the very first things I did when I was getting real involved was produce a show that we did at Norman James Theater uh, and it, we called it Ragtime to Rap. And we looked at the arc of history of popular music. And um, I asked the people who I knew sang gospel music and sacred music if they would mind doing a popular piece. And almost everyone did. And I think I've got a video of that someplace because that was, that was pretty exciting. Like, for instance, I had uh, Karen, Sylvia, and Wendy doing the Supremes. Stop! in the name of love, and uh, get, had all of these amazing um, things that came. When you really think about the source of all black popular music and how it was appropriated and adored and maybe even forgotten where it came from, um, it was something that I really put a lot of thought and energy into. And so through this Arts Council, we actually produced several um, uh, recordings, CD recordings, including one which was uh, where I asked all the people who I'd done gospel music with if they would sing the oldest song they knew, the oldest gospel song they knew, and sing it a cappella. And we made a recording of that. And I've got that collection, uh, and anybody wants, uh, I've got extras if anybody <laughs> would like to have it. Yeah, I love talking about that. That's the Chitlin Circuit. And the Chitlin Circuit happened when the main, even the main, most mainstream artists were not allowed to perform in white clubs. Ray Charles, James Brown, um, Stevie Wonder, Otis Redding, Aretha and her sister, all performed at the corner of College and Cannon, I mean College and Calvert uh, in Chestertown, at Charlie Graves' Uptown Club. It's a small club, but it packed them in, and uh, we've done a lot of uh, memories with the people who have overheard and, and were actually there to, to see and experience that. And of course, the famous thing, I've, I've told the story many times, but I wanted a historic marker to go up in front of the armory and say, James Brown performed here and Leslie was there. But you ask about the GAR Hall and Sumner Hall, and because of my intense interest in th being thrilled with uh, producing this music and uh, helping in any way I could, it turned out that the building, as most of you know, had been built in uh, 19... That building had been built in 1909 and was the post for the returned African-American Civil War soldiers. The organization was called Grand Army of the Republic, which was a, a, a national organization of all Union soldiers, whether they were black or white. So it was like an integrated, essentially integrated national organization. And uh, each post was had its own 
a group of people who ran it and it, its own name. And it was named Charles Sumner Post, Charles Sumner Post number 25. It was named after the famous Massachusetts senator who was an abolitionist and an associate of Lincoln who worked very, very hard on, on abolitionist policies. And there was a, a to, just to continue with the story of Charles Sumner, he had, um, he had argued with a, a Southern senator. The Southern senator took such offense that later on in the day, Charles Sumner sitting at his desk in Congress and this southern senator comes up with his cane and starts to beat the bloody hell out of poor Charles Sumner. And he was beaten so badly that uh, he never recovered from it. Uh, his, his injuries were horrible. But, um, but he was beloved and honored by uh, the African-American uh, community because of that. So that, that's why it's named Sumner, Sumner Hall. But uh, because I was, had the Kent County Arts Council, we thought maybe the Arts Council and Sumner Hall could possibly uh, be interwoven, be collaborative uh, as the building got finished. It had been rescued and stabilized, but there's still a lot, a lot to be done to finish it. So with a huge community effort and of support of local, statewide, and international, even international, grants and uh, help, it's become the place it is today, which I'm really super proud of. And I think it's very effective, it's beautiful, it, it's welcoming, and it's, uh, it's got all this history. <laughs>